Okay, hello everyone. Good day, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 10th of February 2022. Hope everybody is well. Uh, today we are honored uh, and delighted to host our dear colleague, uh, Professor Eduardo Gildin from uh, the University of uh, Texas A&M. Uh, Eduardo is a professor of petroleum engineering at Texas A&M University. Dr. Gildin received his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin in aerospace engineering and has held postdoc positions with Rice University and UT Austin as well before joining the Petroleum Engineering Department at Texas A&M as an assistant professor first. He was promoted to associate professor with tenure in 2015 and then to professor in 2021. He also holds an MSc in mechatronics from University of Sao Paulo and a BSc in mechanical engineering uh, from Brazil. Dr. Gildin teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in the mathematics of reservoir simulation, data analytics, and reduced order modeling and has published more than 120 papers in peer-reviewed journals and conferences. His research has been supported by grants from many organizations, including NSF, DOE, Department of Energy, DOD, NASA, and industry, with main topics and themes in physics-based and data-driven reduced order modeling for reservoir simulation and optimization, and drilling modeling control and automation. Dr. Gilding was an associate editor for SDE Journal, the Society uh, of Petroleum Engineers Journal, and has been involved in the technical committees within SDE, especially with the Reservoir Simulation Conference, LAC, PEC, and several SDE workshops. Uh, Professor Gilding was inducted into the SPE Distinguished Membership, a prestigious achievement in 2021, and was the recipient of the Texas A&M Dean of Engineering Excellence Award, Associate Professor in 2018, and the College of Engineering Outstanding Contributions Award, beside many other professorship awards that he has collected through his remarkable career so far. It's a true pleasure and honor, Eduardo, to host you today. Thank you for graciously accepting our invitation. It's quite been extremely busy. Uh, we are all looking forward to your lecture. To the audience, please note Eduardo's lecture would last for about half an hour and then followed by questions and discussions. Like always, please do type your questions in the chat box. And I forgot to introduce our invited co-host of today. And we have Julian Maas here from, uh, from Heviot Watt, colleague of uh, Sebastian. Sebastian would not make it, but Julian um, also nicely accepted to co-host the event today. So we have the pleasure to have him today with us too. So uh, without any further ado, uh, Eduardo, we are all looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you, Hadi. Uh, thank you for the, uh, for the introduction. Thank you uh, as well, Sebastian, for the invitation. Uh, and uh, I've been watching some of the... Uh, the, uh, the lectures on this seminar series and very well impressed. So uh, thanks for again for the invitation. Thank it's a pleasure you. to Thank be you. here. Um, so uh, what I want to talk to you about, it is a little bit of, uh, I know, I, I, as you may have, as you may know, I'm, I've been doing model reduction for a long time, uh, but now we have a little bit of a different perspective and uh, we want to tie this into a digital twin framework. Um, for operations and uh, helping operations in, 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 in other ventures. Okay, um, I just want to acknowledge, uh, you know, f f uh, some of my uh, colleagues here that uh, worked with me on that, and uh, support from, uh, as Heidi mentioned, uh, DOE, NSF, Zacta, uh, and other 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 institutes. Um, okay, so what it is, what I'd like to accomplish. Um, we are f far away from that, but uh, that's what I want to, uh, you know, eventually accomplish. So this is a wish list in Digital Twin, and uh, as you can see here, it's a professor here in the architecture department uh, that develops a Digital Twins for for an uh, architecture and other purposes here. But you see here that he's holding a uh, a, a model of an airplane, 
as well, he's holding a digital twin of the airplane. And whatever he, unfortunately, I, I don't have the video. He has the video on his uh, website. But uh, um, whenever he changes the uh, the position of the aircraft, the, the digital twin as well fly fly with him. Okay, And the idea is that uh, we like to have in our hands exactly a reservoir. Right, a reservoir, whatever that means, can be the subsurface model, can be uh, surface modeling, can be uh, you know a drilling uh, uh, equipment and uh, some other things. So what I wanna that's that's what I mentioned here. This is my wish list in digital twin. Uh, as you're gonna see, that's not a simple thing to do. Right, um, but if you look at uh, you know uh, you know a couple of uh, you know articles here coming from JPT. And the, there's a, the energy transition. If you look at this particular this article, they talk about you know the, the you know there's a lot of uh, uh, you know changes coming in, but mostly in the digital form, right? Besides the you know philosophically what you should go with uh, renewables or other things. And the same thing here. Uh, there's a recent uh, you know JPT as well. Uh, oil companies demand digital their way, and they talks about digitization in the in the oil industry, and in particular. Uh, going to uh, a little bit of reflection on, uh, you know, in the digital twin as well. Okay, uh, so those are very, uh, you know, important aspects and important things that uh, you know, our our uh, industry are uh, is talking about. Um, if you go and to, you know, see a little bit of the spectrum of uh, you know uh, what uh, what we can do in our industry, right? We can go from uh, uh, you know, hydrocarbon production to clean energy to CO2 storage to hydrogen storage, right? Um, and of course, I mean, uh, petroleum engineers own the subsurface, right? And you should be able to uh, give a, a fast and robust way to optimize an answer, whatever the answer is, right? So that's uh, what uh, a digital twin may give to you is exactly that, uh, you know, help to get a fast and robust way to optimize or to obtain an answer. Okay, whatever whatever application you have, okay, but uh, I know uh, as you see a commonality between these all these uh, you know uh, you know problems in the in the subsurface, right? Even surface, right? Uh, it is that uh, you know if you want to simulate those things, right? They are they all involves a large scale uh, system. Uh, if you are using a, a simulator for prediction. That has always been the case. That is a computational expensive, even though you can, uh, you know, use a uh, large-scale computations to do that. Right. Uh, the idea of the digital twin is that you want to do this on the fly. Right. We want to do this not as a, uh, a, uh, you know, as a after the fact. We want to do this as you get data. Okay. Um, again, we need a fast and robust way to obtain an answer, uh, whatever answer it is. So we need to be able to do that. Okay. So digital twin in the energy sector is not new, right? Uh, as you as you see here in this uh, this this article here in 2018 from SPE, um, there has been a lot uh, done in particular for uh, drilling. Uh, and you see here a, a, a mirror image of a, a oil platform here, and that's basically has been done mostly for operation purposes, right? Um, you see here on the top left a, um, a digital twin for a, uh, in a windmill, right? And again, that's an uh, energy sector. You see here an uh, uh, energy twin for a, uh, a menu, uh, like smart manufacturing system as well related to energy gains and, and, and some other things. Okay, So it, the digital twin concept in energy is not new, right? But what we are looking at, we're looking at, and I keep saying that a, a reservoir simulator, it is a digital twin in some ways, right? We are able to simulate things. We are able to go inside the reservoir. We are able to change things here and there. You know, drill wells as you go along. You can see horizontal wells, vertical wells. You can see uh, injectors, producers. You can uh, you know see properties. You can see faults. You can see many things uh, as we simulate, right? But what uh, one has to have in mind that uh, this simulation, like it is expensive, right? Uh, and, uh, and very often we we we, we do that, uh, you know, not taking into account that that uh, uh, you know things are has to be in real time, right? And uh, you know a, a problem here is that uh, the, the philosophy of a digital twin is that it requires integration of uh, simulation and, and and data, right? Instantaneously in this virtual environment, 
right? And and you see here that uh, you know for this particular case, uh, you know if you want to map out uh, you know uh, pressure saturations and so forth, the problem it is that uh, you know in, in in case of millions and billions of uh, you know variables that one has to track every time. And so, oh, sorry. Um, and but and even if you're going to do optimization as well, right? And one has to track not only the states but has to track as well the control variables, and that becomes a a lot expensive. There has been a lot of stuff done in the past 15 years or so in how we actually do a, a, a better simulation and better integration, better production uh, optimization and so forth. I'm not going to go into that. There has been great, great, uh, uh, you know, publications out there, great uh, methodologies and so forth. But what uh, what uh, a, 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 this idea of integration uh, instantaneously, oops, I don't know why it's changing, uh, what this integration in simulation requires, right, requires that you have a, a, a fast computations on the background. And one of the enablers to do that is exactly the model reduction and data-driven modeling that I'm going to show to you. Uh, today, I'm going to just focus a little bit off, uh, on the model reduction, but uh, if time permits, I can go a little bit more on the data-driven modeling as well. All right, so uh, this is one, one, one issue, right? I mean, how you simulate. The second issue is that, uh, you know, I, when I started up in petroleum, I, I remember many folks, uh, you know, said, well, uh, you know, academia doesn't have data. We don't have data. We want to, you know, uh, match up our simulations. We don't have data. I think ch 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 has, uh, things have changed, right, a lot, right? Now we have a new problem, right? We have a, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know as, as you move on to the digitization and have lots of data now, now the question is what we do with that data, right? What we do with that data? Right, um, and again, going back to the philosophy of digital twin, um, one has to incorporate this huge amount of data uh, uh, in the real time into the into the into the simulation process. Right, so somehow we need some form of a data reduction as well, not only model reduction, but we need some form of a, a data reduction as well. As you can see here in the bottom, I have just a few examples of uh, you know a. Um, uh, a control room with a bunch of data you know, streaming out of a reservoir. Uh, I'll talk briefly in the next slide of uh, DAS, you know, fiber optics coming in to, from an uh, you know, instrumented uh, 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 well. You have here, you can get data real time in high frequency, thousands of hertz uh, and so forth, uh, directly from the drill bit. Okay, imagine now how much data you, you do have, right? And as, as an example here, so uh, we worked a little bit on, uh, uh, you know, trying to uh, understand fracture propagation here. And you see here, uh, uh, <clears throat> just getting a uh, stupid acoustic or micro, uh, micro seismic and DAS uh, out of a data set, one, only one well with 20 stages is about 1.35 terabytes. Okay, of course you can say, well, we can have high, you know, supercomputers to handle that. But if you want to analyze that and get some meaningful information in real time, so that you can incorporate the digital twin, one has to do something with that uh, that data. Okay, here's another case as well. Uh, we, you know, the same project uh, we worked on, uh, you know, inferring, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, fracture geometry and characterization from a uh, distributed acoustic sensing, right? Uh, we worked in the modeling as well, but uh, we worked as well on getting data from uh, uh, data sets. Like the, there's a hydro hydraulic fracture test sites one and two, and there is the forge for geothermal uh, that one can get the data sets. And there's a huge amount of data sets, uh, again, terabytes of data. Right? So again, the problem is model reduction and data reduction. So this is a uh, old picture here, just uh, to to say that uh, you know, uh, if you want to do that for the entire prospect of uh, you know a reservoir, right? You want to uh, have some operations on fast reservoir simulation, you want to have some operations on the fast reservoir characterization, and as well fast operations on drilling, right? So that's that's uh, as important as uh, reservoir as well, right? You know how many how many wells are going to drill. When are you going to do these wells and how you're going to drill these wells will impact tremendously how you, you uh, know, produce out of this reservoir. Okay. Um, so 
you know, mod reduction and data reduction comes into play uh, on these three areas uh, equally, right? Um, let me skip that. I will go back directly to the uh, um, to, to to what I want to talk to you about it. But I, I mean, I, I can provide you these slides. There's some uh, literature here that what we worked on in all these three uh, three areas. Okay, so specifically for for reservoir simulation. So what we are at. So I mean, if you recall the equations of a of a you know a, a, a reservoir, right? The multi-phase flow. Uh, reservoir, you have this equation here on the left-hand side, uh, simplistic right now in, in, in that nature, like multi-phase flow, if you will. Right? Uh, but what is important to us is to identify all these three things. Right? What is the controls? What is the state? And what is the output? Okay. Uh, of course, controls is something that uh, you know you can control into the reservoir. In this particular case, uh, pressures and uh, well flow. Uh, injector flow and and so forth. Um, states it can be pressure saturations. If you have uh, you know a, a compositional simulation, it can be compo uh, compositions and so and so forth. Okay, um, and the output is something that you can measure, right? It can be oil rate, water rate, whatever rate you have, and pressures as well. But let's not forget that uh, intrinsically into a reservoir simulator, right? All these quantities are actually computed based upon the states and computed by the, the Pissman equation, okay? Which is a, a really great equation, but if you really want to take this into the input-output framework, one has to deal carefully with, uh, with that, okay? So let me show now uh, uh, what we are doing in model reduction for reservoir simulation. All right, so what is the idea? The idea is that uh, we have this equation, Okay, which can be you know in a, in a very general form written up into that equation right here, right? Uh, where u here it will be your controls, and x will be your state, right? Um, and the way that we are approaching uh, model reduction is that we want to project this into a uh, the special the states, right? We want to project into a much smaller subspace, right? Where r here, so if you think n in the order of uh, millions and billions. Or maybe in the order of thousands. Okay, um, then uh, we should project that you get a uh, reduced form of this equation. Um, and if you project, uh, you know, using uh, you know petrov galerkin or Galerkin, does not really matter. You get exactly that. Uh, here's the residual form. Here is the uh, your reduced form of the equations. And if you evolve this equation in time, you have a solution in the reduced reduced space. Right. Uh, that's what we call reduced order model. There has been lots of papers, uh, you know, not only myself, but uh, Lou Dolovsky, Jung Durkinson, uh, Ahmed El Sheikhi, and other people out there uh, investigated many, many of those things. There's, you know, good, good uh, publications uh, there. But there are two issues, again, that hasn't been solved. Right. One, the first issue is that uh, if you look at this equation, we always need to go back to the, uh, to the end dimension. Okay, there has there has been a remedy to that, which is called the DAME, discrete empirical interpolation, right? That we worked on, uh, you know, a few years back, right? That somehow, uh, you know, bypass the fact that you need to go back to the n-dimensional. But again, you're going to see in the example, uh, it's not a very robust way to do that. Right? But the second, the second most important issue here is that uh, no output information is used here. Remember the output. Why? I mean, the Pissman equation, right? We don't have uh, output information regarding to that uh, that term or even to that equation, okay? So one has to, if you're going to deal with data, one has to deal with that Y in particular, okay? So just as a model reduction uh, attempt, we've done that, uh, you know, there's, uh, again, um, I'm not the only on, there has been lots of uh, good publications in that, but let me just give an example here. This is a moot stage hydraulic fracturing. Uh, and we can do this type of mod reduction for not only pressure saturation, but also for displacements, okay? And you see here that, uh, you know, uh, the more fractures, so and these guys here represents the number of fractures. So the more fractures that you have, of course, given the uh, uh, overhead associated with all the computations, we get a lot more speed up uh, for more fractures as we go along. And you see that they speed up 
Here in this particular case is 50 times, but uh, we have examples that it goes to 100 times and so forth. Okay, and uh, so speed ups are, are really good, but when it works, right? When it works, right? So the the upshot of that is that there's not a robust what uh, robust yet to say, well, let me click this button and let me uh, get to my reduce our model and and I'm done. There's lots of tweaking here and there, you know, selection of bases and so forth. Okay, so it's a good good method, but uh, involves lots of uh, you know tweaking here and there. So what we are looking at, we are looking at uh, you know an evolution of uh, what the, the the TPWL, right? Which uh, you know uh, back in the you know, 2010, Lou Dolovsky and uh, you know Cardozo published the first work on that, and it was basically to linearize linearize that uh, uh, piecewise linearize the residual equation as you go along into the, the simulation. Okay. Well, I'm not going to go into TPWL, but uh, what is important here is that one can create, out of this nonlinear system, one can create this linear form of the equations. Okay. Uh, in the original form of TPWL, there is no y. So all that you're looking at it is this equation here on the top, okay? And uh, once you find your state in the reduced form, you go back to the uh, original form and you transform this to Pisman equation to a uh, uh, to get rates, right? Um, okay, so what we are looking at? We're looking at, well, can we build these matrices A, B, C, D directly from data, okay? Direct from data. And, and the the, the TPWL is that we can have, we need to have access to the, the simulator somehow. Okay, the hypothesis is it's possible to estimate A, B, C, D based on the dynamic evolution of the states. Okay. All right, so um, again, uh, Lou uh, uh, in 2020, I think two years ago, uh, was using this uh, E2C, uh, E2C embedded control. Really great work. Uh, and if you look at what they, they've done, they get this into a, uh, you know, if you have your TPWL, you're, you're saving up the states, right? Uh, you go this pass through an encoder and decoder and encoder decoder uh, can find what is A and B, okay? Find what is A and B. And again, really good work, but again, it's just for evolution of the states, right? So the question is, how do you get to the Y part? Right, and if you're gonna handle this uh, into the uh, into the uh, you know assimilation part of the data, right? So what we've done, we built upon on uh, loose work, and we came up with a uh, uh, a second type of uh, uh, you know uh, network that uh, you know creates the the C and D for you, the C and D for you. Okay, so that uh, that basically uh, a build up on the on the previous work that creates C and D, and has to do a lot more with what's called system identification perspective, right? We are trying to identify what is the A, B, C, D based upon data, okay? So if you do that, go again to the encoder uh, and go to, and, and I'm not uh, going, uh, and I have a backup slides on to show what is inside those networks, okay? But one can go to these neural networks here um, and compute what would be your C and D or A and B? Okay, so that's kind of a data-driven type of modeling, um, but one can do that and, and get A, B, C, D, right, out of that. So let me just show you here a toy example uh, because then uh, we encounter some issues with that, right? So toy examples, we have a uh, you know wells here. Uh, we simulate this with the particular inputs, okay? Uh, five producers, four injectors, permeability field, something like that. Um, and then we run our, we train our model and we get the solution. Okay. As you can see here, uh, uh, what we call a high fidelity solution is this guy here on the left. Proposition one, it is, uh, you know, coming out, streaming out of a uh, loose paper. Uh, and E2CO embedded to control and, uh, and observe, it is our solution. Okay. Uh, training, it is maybe an issue, right? But uh, we can get by by a special form of training, right? So, anyway, so the, just uh, want to show to you the picture here is <coughs> hydraulic, uh, the uh, high fidelity model, 
uh, you know, at, at least visual inspection, you cannot see much. But if you go to a little bit of our statistics, you see that uh, E2CO, just because you're representing the, uh, the output directly from data, can get a little bit better, better solution. And you can see area statistics and uh, can be found in our paper. Okay, so uh, uh, just an evolution of uh, of uh, this network. And if you have data, you can run, train this uh, simulation, and uh, you know get a proxy out of that. Okay. However, <clears throat> we still have uh, you know if you look at some of the statistics, it's still not uh, uh, you know it's it's a hard job to tell which one is the best one, right? And uh, one thing that we always uh, you know. I'm always concerned is that you know, model reduction, it is really good if you have a linear system, right? So the problem really, it is non, the non-linearities. If you have a non-linear system to begin with, uh, it's much harder problem to get a reduced or a model out of that, okay? So how do you handle non-linearities? And uh, how do we handle non-linearities? It is as follows. Um, instead of linearizing the system in TPWL, why we don't do uh, one step further, which is why don't we bilinearize the system? What I mean by bi bilinearize, right? So if you take the equations, we can write up a form of that equation, something like this, okay? Where we have a linear portion, we have a bilinear portion, and we have a bilinear portion onto the uh, state and controls. Okay, so what I mean by, by linear in the state of controls, if it is a linear independently on X and U, but bilinear in X and U together. Okay, so we've done some work on the, you know, uh, f five years ago or so, uh, representing the, the simulator in that, that form. So in, in that time, <clears throat> we didn't have the capabilities of doing, uh, you know, model reduction for bilinear system was not, uh, was not done well. Okay, now, you know, people that work in that area evolved a lot more, a lot more computational uh, efficient uh, works. So we can now handle this in the quadratic, quadratic bilinear form, okay? Now, the question is, how do you go from the top box to the bottom box, right? Again, we can go through a deep neural net, right? Which is called a Koopman operator and find what is the transformation between the uh, uh, this x and this bilinear form okay and <clears throat> once we have this bilinear form instead of using pod which depend upon uh, uh, uh you know the snapshots we use what's called a balanced truncation form that depends only on the input output perspective of the the solution again handling input and output okay so um We've done that, and, and just a uh, work around nonlinearity. If you're not familiar with coupon operator, right? A coupon operator is basically a, uh, you know, a higher dimensional operator. Uh, you can lift the states to a much higher dimension, but it gives you a linearization of the states. Right? Uh, <clears throat> this is a, uh, you know, if you're working with a, uh, you know, nonlinear system, if you lift this to a, a third, another dimension. You're gonna get to a Kuhlman manifold, and a good example here it is if you have this nonlinear differential equation. If you can find this phi here somehow, and here I'm giving you the phi, right, and do operate on that, the uh, operation on phi becomes linear. Okay. The question is, how do we find that? How do we find it? And how do we find that? We find through again a deep neural net, deep neural net, right, that can give you. Uh, the solution for phi. So if you pass the states and train that using an autoencoder architecture, you can find that phi. Okay. So let me go. I think I'm getting almost out of time, right? Um, so we, we tested that into a very simplistic case, but about five minutes would be fine. So sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. We tested that out of a uh, buckle leverett just for simplistic, uh, you know, perspective. Um, and you see here solutions match really really well on on um, um on the simplistic buck leverage when we go to a much uh and and uh you know just a you know that's small problem anyway right and uh, one simulation for seconds but what is impressive it is that once you find the proxy it is really really fast okay um 
And again, uh, you know, if you are doing uh, you know certain quantification, right, one hour as opposed to 2.3 seconds, that's what we gain out of that. Okay. So again, another toy example: one injector, two producers. Uh, uh, there is a very mathematical handling here. Uh, why? <laughs> because uh, when you go to control, right? When you add up a control here, you, right? Remember that we have the simplest differential equation that can find phi. When you go and have you here, things become a little bit more fuzzy, right? And how you handle that, it is really, really important. So we can find this operator by going through the, uh, the, the network, but here we need to do some, uh, some mathematical, uh, you know, um, uh, algebra here to find uh, the solution of that, okay? Uh, I, I'm gonna skip the, this, the uh, it's in my backup slides, but basically you can find this through another uh, encoder decoder perspective if you handle correctly the, this, the, this uh, differential here, okay? So we tested that uh, and you see here the evolution on the left-hand side is the full order model. The right-hand side, it is the, uh, the coupon uh, type of solution handling with uh, injectors and producers. Uh, and you see that uh, works really well, right? Uh, for this particular case. And then one simulation, uh, MRST 45 seconds, uh, one simulation, uh, and, and uh, uh, we have two ways of doing that. I, I'm not uh, going into details, but we have what's called a no, full non-linear and one that is uh, full linear, right? But if you see the differences, we are going from eight seconds from 45 seconds to eight seconds to 0.15 seconds, okay? Of course, there are, uh, you know, reservoirs that uh, we don't get a really good match, although we get a good match on cumulatives. The individual well production, it is not 100% uh, matching for some of the problems that we worked on. So we went back and said, well, how can you do that? How, I mean, how can you fix that? And then we started looking at, uh, you know, what people have done in that area, right? And what we observed here, let me go back here. We observed that uh, most of the things that happens when this, uh, this does not match, it is all related to the, especially when you have water breakthrough on that well, right? So we say, well, there's something with this saturation front, right, that uh, one cannot handle. Then we started looking at uh, literature, and then uh, we saw that uh, Chalapi published that. Um, and, and, and there's, uh, of, of course, you know, PDEs are not new. Uh, everybody knows that, uh, you know, uh, to stabilize that numerically, one has to add up a, a, a viscosity term here. But uh, what uh, Chalapi was able to do is to find this, uh, this term here um, uh, directly from, uh, from a neural net. Right. Uh, the the issue for us, right, is that uh, you need to define a priori coefficient for that, right. And if you're going on this digital twin perspective, right, uh, that's not an option, right. We want to get this directly from data. Okay. Um, so we looked at uh, some more on that, and uh, you see there's some. Uh, you know, although you can get a uh, uh, nice uh, convergence here in the shock front, there's some that you don't depend upon on the viscosity term, right? You, you get a unstable, unstable solution, okay? So what we did then was to look for a, um, a adaptive training of that, uh, that uh, learning viscosity, but not only adaptive training, but say, well, can you only apply this viscosity term only when it's needed, okay? And uh, so we looked at, uh, you know, uh, the architecture, There'll be a paper coming up in the archive and we're gonna publish this. This is a joint work with a professor here in electrical engineering that uh, you know, does a lot of uh, uh, you know, deep neural net, right? Uh, what we were able to do is find, uh, based upon data, identify exactly the solution of where exactly to apply the viscosity term direct, directly on the fly, direct on the fly, okay? So if you look at uh, bucket leverage solution here, Right, we're only applying uh, the viscosity term exactly on the shock where the shock happens, and we are we don't know a priori the viscosity term, but we identify that and we identify exactly the location. Okay, 
of course we we haven't implemented that that's a new paper coming out but we are need, what we're going to do now is go back to all these framework here and implement all together in that framework so that uh, hopefully we will be able to you know match up all the wells uh, and get all the solutions in the in, in this proxy proxy form okay okay so just remarks uh, the uh, this the solution of this uh, embedded to control and uh, estimate uh, can estimate well data right uh, coupon bilinear balance truncation seems a good approach uh, especially for handling input output right uh, there's uh, more technicality on the you know you can look at the paper we use a two-phase uh, flux uh, function uh, for the the training um, and 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 so forth. Okay, so as you go along, right, there are lots of steps to be added, right? In particular, how if you have an uncertainty uh, parameter here on, on your model, right? How you handle that, right? Um, so that's one thing that we are looking at and looking at uh, how we go and, uh, you know, go back to the, uh, to the, the big, uh, big scale reservoirs and uh, handle that uh, using our, our training, okay? Um, and I, again, you know, eventually going through the, uh, to the, the uh, you know, a little bit more on the proxy and uh, a little bit more on the digital twin framework. Okay. Uh, I have, I just have a, just a one minute to, to uh, let me just uh, remark something here uh, on the data reduction side, right? We've done some work on that as well. Uh, let me just, my slide got stuck here. Did it shut down? No problem. Just you can reshare. Okay, yeah, let me. It's possible. Yeah, I broke it outside the broadcasting, so please. Yeah, it's uh, it's reloading here. Hopefully, that's this this sure. this on the fly. So let's see. I think that uh, simulator video that I posted uh, is oh, 150, 150, 150 mag. 150 mag. I think that's <laughs> carry on a lot of. Uh, <laughs> it was heavy. Not so I'm, it looks like that it, it is open now. OK. Uh, yeah. I'm OK. So there. let me go. So let me just show uh, two things here in the data reduction framework uh, really quickly. Um, we, we've done some work as well using, uh, you know, that's the problem we that your, I posted. We see your uh, oh, okay. Uh, slide. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, now in the data reduction, what we are looking at is a, a tensor, tensor, tensor form of model reduction, right? Tensors are you know, multi-dimensional arrays, right? And uh, you know, if uh, you can go beyond, uh, you know, three dimension. Okay. So what we are looking at, uh, you know, a particular form of the singular value decomposition that's called high order singular value decomposition. And we have a publication on that using permeability fields for uh, you know, three, four years ago. Uh, but what we're doing now, we are storing now the DAS into this tensor form. Not only a 3D tensor, but a 4D as well with temporal uh, description. Okay, so again, we take data, we, 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 we store this into a tensor format, and we handle this <coughs> uh, in time as well, and do this 4D uh, tensor, okay, uh, and then operate on this high order singular value decomposition uh, with a 82 percent of uh, comp uh, you know, compression on the data. So imagine that you have terabytes, now you have a 82 percent of reduction on that terabytes. Just using the compressed form of the data, we are able to recover the traces of this, uh, you know, the, the signal. Okay, and if you think here uh, as well, uh, uh, you know the P wave, S wave, and, and so forth. Okay, so again, that's a one form of uh, um, you know a, uh, in a data reduction that we are working on, right? Uh, and this as well allows you to actually filter out a bunch of a noise out of the data just using this high order singular value decomposition. Okay? So that's a there was a paper. Uh, uh, in um, 
uh, hydraulic fracture uh, and conventional uh, resources, uh, you know, this, this this year. And let's just finish up what we're going with the digital twin on uh, drilling, right? We as well work on the drilling navigation, right? So, you know, you can think about navigation. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm background in aerospace, right? So we always look at the navigation in some ways, right? But navigation in drilling area, you're navigating through an unknown field, right? Uh, as we do in a rover go, that goes to Mars. There has been a lot of technology now recently. Um, and we developed a, a form of, uh, you know, a drilling rig that can go up and down. Um, um, and that basically, uh, we are. This is a NASA project that we worked on, and they say, well, what happens if you want to fly a drilling rig to Mars to capture or to drill for uh, for samples, right? So one has to to do that. So here is our drilling rig, what we call Aggie rig, right? So we have two of those. One is a standard rig, but see this guy here. It is the our uh, 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 drilling rig uh, that can collapse and go up. Right, as and that it is used now for our. You know, it's going to be used now that we have this built and simulated and uh, model. We're going to use now as a test bed for our digital twin on a drilling drilling system. Okay, and just want to do some advertisement. Um, I'm part of this open source drilling community. Um, it's uh, you know again an open source. You can go there. Lots of, uh, if you go to GitHub, lots of open source codes uh, for drilling modeling. Okay, so that's a, uh, that's a good thing if you are in that area. So let me stop here. I think I went uh, over. So let me uh, stop here, say thank you, um, and I'm open for any questions that you, that you might have. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Uh, very informative and very, very nice. So I see plenty of questions already posted. And usually the audience take the priority to to have their questions answered. I hope that we, you and I, could also catch up after the talk sure. as well. You mentioned plenty interesting subjects and questions. So Julian, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, so thank you, Eduardo. And uh, indeed, we have a lot of very interesting question um, with several themes. And we're going to start with a question from Yu Wang Wang. We say thank you for the very interesting talk. Seems to me. The digital twin is done for an object which is accessible and can be observed in real world, while reservoirs are inaccessible and there are many uncertainties involved. So how should the digital twin be tuned when dealing with uncertain systems? That's a great question. And um, that's a philosophical question, if you will, right? <laughs> uh, of course, I mean, digital twin nowadays uh, are, are served for physical physical things, right? They want to match up a physical things. And of course, we don't know a reservoir, right? Uh, but the philosophy of a digital twin, it is that we can incorporate data in real time. Uh, so when you have a simulator, I mean, you there are lots of uh, great work. Uh, you know, take uh, John Chen from the University of Calgary. He has a, 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 a dark room where he has a virtual reality uh, equipment that you can go inside your reservoir and play with your reservoir, right? I don't know if you've seen that, but uh, uh, you can put some goggles and go inside the reservoir. Uh, but that uh, type of structure doesn't handle real-time data, right? If you are in adding real-time data to your simulator, that's basically a running an Eclipse or a IMAX or whatever simulator you have, right? Uh, we want to philosophically, we want to operate in real time. If we have a physical quantity, a physical entity as a reservoir, I don't know, but the, we are looking at the philosophy of the digital twin for that. Okay, thank you. Um, so then we're going to jump to a question about multi resolution data. And this one is from uh, Wilhelmine von Rohen. Hopefully, I pronounced this correctly. Data is given by seismic low resolution and EM well bore high resolution, how could one benefit from multi-scale ROM framework to better do invest modeling in this case? I think that's, uh, you're giving me a lot, really good idea to start up on something new, 
right? Um, we have, we are, we are very also interested in that too, Eduardo. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So uh, right now we we haven't uh, dealt with that yet, right? And but that's a much, that's a very important problem. And and there 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 has been uh, some work in model reduction for um, multi-resolution type of uh, model reduction, right? Um, you know, in reservoir, we might think on an upscaling type of thing, but uh, uh, in other areas, there has been a multi-resolution, uh, you know, model reduction, but not with the multi-resolution data, right? So I, I, I'm, I'm eager to, to put my hands dirty on that. <laughs> so I think we're, gonna, we're going to continue in, in this direction, hopefully giving you more ideas. And uh, Maris wants to know, about fractures. So I uh, think, uh, have you tested your method for naturally fractured systems? Of course, not different scale, but also heterogeneity. Would it work readily or would you have to change things with your fractures? So the, the, the framework, so anything that you can simulate, uh, you can handle in model reduction, right? In the following way, anything that you can get a state out of it. It can be a uh, you know natural fracture reservoir that you have a uh, you know uh, I don't know a fluid from uh, you know even uh, uh, matrix to to fracture and so forth. Anything that you can simulate, you can pose this as a state, right? And as a state, you can get snapshots of those states, so the framework is able to handle that, right? Um, uh, and, 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 you know, going more to these uh, uh, range of scales, right? Though I think I might say that uh, you may need a lot, a lot of those snapshots as you go along in the framework, right? Uh, in the vicinity of those uh, fractures. Uh, and, and that's what we see in particular for wells, right? Uh, in this, the, 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 the grid blocks that are close to the wells, we need a lot more of those snapshots, right? And I'm assuming fractures as well. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, going through this question uh, quite fast with some very, very great answer. Um, so the next one is about history matching from Femke Vosepool. Again, sorry if I pronounce this not correctly. Can you elaborate on how you plan to apply these techniques for history matching? Um, okay, so uh, the the classical model reduction way of uh, uh, doing that, uh, if you look at one of my slides, there is a data there, right? We can parameterize that data, right? And uh, we can apply a form of model reduction to that data as well, right? Um, so in the model reduction setting, right? The one parameterize the uncertainties in some ways and get a reduced form of the, your, 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 your simulator based upon those uh, reduced form of the uncertainty, right? Um, as, 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 as you saw, that's uh, in, in the works, right? We don't have a, uh, uh, a good, uh, good method yet to do that. But uh, we, we, we published a paper a few years back on um, a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, if you have a, uh, multiple realizations, of a reservoir, one can do model reduction based upon the multiple realizations, right? Um, but you know, it's still a very, very, you know, very open question how you do that. For you know, again, philosophically, you might say, well, am I looking for a single reduced order model that can help handle uncertainties and all the realizations, or am I looking for a multiple reduced order of uh, models that can handle multiple realizations? The answer, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think it's credit to your work that uh, all those questions are about how to push this further because mm -hmm. the state of the heart is here and, and quite clear and, and there is so much more potential and that's what uh, the audience want to know where we're going. Uh, so the next question which is someone uh, with the name O, um, Chris, it's about what happens when your system becomes more complex. Do you have any insight into how the cost of training the ETCO proxy, the most high fidelity model simulation, scales with, for example, the number of wells or number of control intervals or maybe other 
yeah. uh, complexity. Sorry. Yeah, this is this is one of the uh, beauty and the beast of the uh, the uh, the uh, you know data driven modeling imposing that form, right? Uh, uh, still, <clears throat> training a neural network is still expensive. There has been uh, some recent work on uh, you know if you if you look at the literature on the deep learning on how to do a training uh, sampling and so forth uh, for training, uh, but that is still an issue. It's still an issue. And, you know, if you look at all my slides, and uh, I always have an, uh, a comment there. Once, once trained, so when I, when I have my uh, my time, uh, uh, my, my my time, uh, you know, simulation time, um, I always have, have like there. And uh, once it's trained, so training a, uh, you know, we are operating now with a large large system. Uh, it takes, uh, I would say, ten hours to train that. 10, 10 hours and uh, and, and again it was trained um, you get a solution in a very few seconds or less than a few less than a second right but it takes the, you know a large amount of the training uh, uh, you know uh, energy to do that okay um so the investor all was on one November. I guess you might know him already. It's from TNO yeah. and Tudex. Yes. Good. Say hi. <laughs> Good. Uh, you're uh, answering this question very well. And, uh, yeah, and, and, and thank you also. Well. Thanks as well. So, okay. Thanks a lot. So. Um, yes. So there's. We, we have time then to go back, and uh, there was a question that were a, a few more, minutes. Yes. A few yes. minutes. Uh, we were, we were a little bit more technical, so. Yuan Wang was was asking uh, on slide twenty. Did you also quantify the computational cost of the basis functions? How many of them were needed? Uh, let me go back to twenty. I think he should refer to reduce order modeling that you showed. I guess for uh, yeah. for okay. factors. Okay. So uh, yes. Yeah, so um, uh, so. If you look at my uh, highlighted note in the very end of the slide, that uh, say, well, uh, there's lots of tweaking, lots of tweaking, right? So what you need to do, uh, you know, running one simulation. So basically, all these physics-based uh, reducer model they start up with a uh, one full simulation of uh, of your reservoir. So you, you, if you need to think about overhead cost, just think about one simulation, the full simulation of your reservoir. Um, getting the basis out of that, it is easy because once you have the simulation, you can play with uh, how many bases you want. So the cost of uh, identifying good bases is not the problem. That's a, that's not a problem, right? The more the the overhead associated with the one full simulation, that is the order of magnitude of the cost of that, right? Um, I don't know if that's what he want to know, but uh, that's basically the uh, what I understood of, of his question. I think um, that seemed correct. Uh, you all can uh, precise if that's not. Uh, if we have time for one more question, uh, yeah, I will just pick yes. up another question from Mike Boone. Um, who, um, so, so I say thank you for the very informative talk. And I miss the key ID, and I did too, I confess, uh, beyond making it work for nonlinear systems. Sure. Can you elaborate a bit further uh, on that? Sure. sure. The idea of uh, you know um, you know model reduction for nonlinear system there is only uh, there is a one really good method which is a POD, right? A proper orthogonal decomposition. What is proper orthogonal decomposition? You simulate, right? You get these basis uh, functions. You perform a singular value decomposition, and you have uh, by uh, byproduct uh, your your projection matrices, right? Once you get these projection matrices and uh, you project on a nonlinear system, right? Every time that you project, right? If you look at the uh, the equation, right? You need always to go back to the um, to the full scale to evolve the equation in time, right? So if if you look at the the, the projection equation, right? So there has been two ways of handling this this bypass that you have to go back to the uh, uh, um, um, you know, go back to the full other, full other model. One, it is to do what's called discrete empirical interpolation. And basically, you're selecting points on the Jacobian that you want to go back to the full order model. You're not going back all the way 
to the n dimension. You're not computing the Jacobians and the states for the n dimension. You're comp computing for particular points of the, uh, the domain. That's what's called pro proper orthogonal decomposition. Um, a second way it is to use a linearization process, right? You, you piecewise linearize your equation, right? <clears throat> every so often, and this every so often is open to discussion as well, right? Every so often you linearize your equation, and then you have a linear system, a piecewise linear system that you don't have to deal with nonlinearities, right? Uh, this is good, but in, uh, this is, uh, you know, if you're having a very high nonlinear system as we do, linearizing all the time, it is not good, okay? So a, a intermediate uh, form of that, it is called a bilinearization. So if you go back to the dynamical system perspective, right, uh, from linear to nonlinear, there is an intermediate step that is, uh, you know, as, as you think about a Taylor series expansion, you're taking more terms on that Taylor series, right? And in particular, you're taking a, a term on a Taylor series that is bilinear, bilinear form. Right? There's a linear portion, there's a bilinear portion. Okay. And that's exactly how we are handling the nonlinearities. We are bilinearizing the, the equation of the reservoir in such a way that um, we can find that, uh, that the projection matrix directly from data. Okay, directly from data, right? Using a Koopman, this, this, this notion of Koopman operator. Right? So that's basically the, the, the idea. So lots of thank you also from the audience about the elaborative answers. And we are actually on the time to close this session. I would encourage all the audience, uh, please get in touch with Eduardo. It just all the questions are so interesting and we are enjoying his also answers pretty much. Thanks a lot, Eduardo, for this absolutely inspiring and informative talk. Uh, and I'd like to also take the chance to uh, introduce our next week speaker. Uh, next week, we are going to uh, host uh, Professor Auli Niemi from Uppsala University in Sweden. Uh, the beauty of these webinars online is that we can move from Texas a and now to Uppsala University in no time. <laughs> Although we wish we could come and see you in person, <laughs> really, it wonder, but that's yeah. <laughs> and here to host you here too. So, so anyways, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, I need to just say that what topic uh, Auli will uh, speak, she will speak about CCS, so carbon capture storage, and uh, we would be looking very much forward to see from the Swedish perspective about what they are developing there. Yes, I'm looking to forward to it as well. So that's, uh, <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for the invitation. And uh, you, uh, you know, the, the, the questions that, that you guys asked were fantastic. Uh, lots of uh, avenues for New things yes. and old things as well. No, it's so there great. Is a, yes. As you can see, there are a lot of work to be done. Yeah, and it's it's great that the community is so connected, and we see people every week uh, coming, and they they have very relevant questions, and so so it's really a, a, a very engaged audience that we have, and it's really nice. So I'm really delighted that you enjoyed this hour as well. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for being so nice and yeah. delivering such such an informative talk. And we will, so, we'll, Hadi, we'll talk offline for other things. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, all the very best, everyone. Thank you very much. Have a nice uh, week and uh, stay happy and healthy. And we see you all again next week, the same time. Uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. All the best, Julian. Bye bye.